Welcome to my home office. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with a with a short safety moment, something that uh, I'm a big fan of, something that I use to anchor and ground most meetings that I do. So my safety moment starts on the 1st of July last year, and it's a very personal safety moment that I haven't actually shared before, but it fits quite nicely in this context. On the 1st of July last year, I caught what I thought was a cold, and uh, it stayed with me for about seven to 10 days. I tested for COVID, I came back negative, and it was, it was, it was just a cold, but what stayed with me was a raspy voice. And um, about a month later, my partner commented that the raspy voice was still there and I should really go and see a doctor. So I phoned my practice and said, uh, you know, I caught a cold, I've got this raspy voice. And they said, right, we'll, we'll have a telephone appointment with you. So thank you, excellent. So they gave me a call back, we went through a telephone appointment and the doctor said, it's nothing to worry about. Um, if it hasn't cleared up in three weeks, give me a call back. I said, thank you, and uh, off I went. And uh, three weeks later, it still hadn't cleared up. So um, I gave the surgery a call back and said to the doctor, um, you know, you said to call me. The doctor said, uh, said, okay, has it got any better? And I said, well, I think it has, but I'm not too sure. And the doctor said, okay, well, let's do the same again. Go away for three weeks and uh, come back again if it, if it hasn't got any better. And if it has, great. So, okay. Needless to say, in three weeks' time, I still had the raspy voice. So the doctor said, okay, well, why don't you come in and see me face to face? So I went into the surgery and sat down, and the doctor asked me um, quite an extensive bunch of questions. And I could tell that he was getting more and more interested and also concerned as the uh, consultation went on. At the end of the consultation, he said to me that uh, you're exhibiting symptoms of, of two conditions. The first condition is what they call silent reflux, which has potentially damaged your voice box. But unfortunately, you're showing more, more symptoms of a, a type of quite aggressive cancer. So at this point, I thought, wow, okay. And he said, I'm gonna book you in for a emergency chest X-ray. And I'm also going to book you in to see a consultant. So I said, okay, so how do I find out information about this? And the doctor said, well, what to do is look at the NHS website, but give me a call if you if you need to find out anything, and I'll I'll tell you all about it. Now the cancer that it could potentially have been was lung cancer. And unfortunately, only one in three people survived for more than a year after diagnosis. So that wasn't in a great place. So for the next three weeks, until I had my chest x-ray and the consultation with the consultant, I got my affairs in order. I sat down and spoke to HR about end of life treatment. And I made sure that all those that I was leaving behind were gonna be left behind in the best possible place financially whilst I was away. I got my chest x-ray, which was an incredibly underwhelming experience, literally in and out. Can't praise the UK's NHS enough. And then um, I had an appointment with a consultant a week later, and the consultant walked into the room with a huge smile and shook my hand and said, good afternoon, Mr. Harris, how are you? And I said, let me stop you right there. Do I have cancer? And he said, no, you don't. I found no evidence of it whatsoever. You have silent reflux. Now, when he said that, the relief that I had in my system, I just, I just can't describe it to you. But for four weeks, I was living with the thought that, unfortunately, my demise was quite imminent. I didn't tell anyone about that. My best friend had just lost his mother through cancer. My partner was losing her grandfather at the time. And it just didn't feel appropriate to tell anyone without a conclusive diagnosis. So I kept it to myself. Whether that was the right choice or the wrong choice, I'll debate for quite some time. But what it does tell us is, but it doesn't matter who you're talking to or what you're talking about. It's very unlikely that you're ever going to get the true whole picture from someone. And the people that work for you will be fighting their own battles in the background. They're only at work for a small amount of time. 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to address mental health risk within your management system. We're going to talk about how to design jobs. We're going to talk about how to be proactive. But in the back of your mind, when you're doing things like this, you must always be cognizant of the fact that you're not always going to have the entire picture, that some of that picture will be at home in a personal life. And the personal life is exceptionally powerful. So that's hopefully my safety moment to uh, to anchor this meeting. Um, so what this webinar isn't and what it is, well, in the in the words of Michael Porter, uh, the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do as well as what to do. So what this webinar isn't. Uh, we're not going to have a clinical discussion on mental health conditions. That's going to be left to our medical professional colleagues. It's not going to be a specific quantification of mental health risk because every organization, every industry, and most importantly, every person is different, and hence the burden of risk is different. We're not going to have any subjective opinions which are based on biased context. We are humans. We can't help but have subjective opinion on biased context, but we're going to try and try and steer away from that. We're not going to talk about a one size fits all. It's just not practical. And we're also going to acknowledge the fact that we still need to learn. And this is not going to be our own organization specific journey map, because that's up to you to create. What this is going to be is a forum for intelligent discussion, I hope. And what I'll do is I'll stop after slide nine and uh, I'll take any questions. And then we'll we'll go on. I've, I've got about 20 slides. I'm not a PowerPoint presenter, so I don't know how, how well we'll go with that because we'll uh, we'll feel our way and we'll, we'll pull in the threads that give the most value. This is gonna be a presentation of valid source risk data. It's gonna be a, a presentation of a meta-analysis of objective expert opinion. And it's going to be an acknowledgement of the need for research on a subject that we are still feeling our way on, no matter how expert we think we are. And hopefully what it's going to provide you is the, the building blocks to use your own initiative and put together that organization with a specific journey map. So how we're going to do that is I'm going to talk to you about who I am, why I'm here. I'm going to make an attempt at a cost estimate. I'm going to rationalize the commercial case. I'm going to talk about some core standards, which you can use as a framework, um, overall umbrella pitch framework, which you can then bespoke to your own organization. I'm going to talk about how to design a better employee experience. And then I'm going to talk about the first steps that we can all take in order to implement this within the management system of our respective organizations. So who am I and why am I here? It's a great question. So I'm uh, very proud to say that I'm a fellow of the IIRSM. Um, I'm also a chartered member of IOSH. I did my undergraduate degree in business and economics before starting a career in private security. I then progressed on to oil and gas, where I did a postgrad degree in risk management, and I'm a part-time lecturer at Robert Gordon's University. I work with a number of voluntary organizations, member-led organizations, everyone from the International Association of Drilling Contractors to the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and I've been fortunate enough to work with some incredible organizations throughout my career, uh, stretching from BP and Shell to Total and Lloyd's Register. And currently, as Sue said, I'm the global head of HSES for Vices Group. So that gives you an idea of who I am. So let's talk about why I'm here. So let's talk about stress, first of all, and let's define that. What we'll, what we'll say is that it's a harmful reaction that people have due to undue pressures and demands placed on them at work. Now, there is a very interesting, a very nebulous, and undefined conversation between pressure and stress. So pressure, for example, is when 15 All Blacks take the rugby field 
and they're under pressure to do well. And they use that pressure in a healthy way to create a winning outcome. Stress is when that pressure turns into an unhealthy condition. And we start to see physical and behavioral changes to their detriment. The figures are absolutely astronomical. So the labor force survey gave us in 2020 and 2021, there was an estimated 822,000 workers affected by work-related stress, depression, or anxiety within the UK. And of those 449,000 reported that this was caused or made wor worse by the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, which is bringing a raft or a tidal wave towards us just now of what people are loosely discussing as pandemic trauma. So this actually represents an incidence frequency of 2,480 per 100,000 workers and accounts for 50% of all work-related ill health cases right now. Now, if we have a look at that instance rate, 2,480 per 100,000, and we compare that to COVID, which you know, we can we can state as a relatively well-known benchmark that we can say we're competent with the ratios. Um, in Scotland, in mid-February, we were anything from 250 to 550 per 100,000 workers. And we're now sitting in terms of stress, depression, or anxiety, far, 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 far beyond that. So some more stats. The reason I put the stats in the PowerPoint presentation is so that you can uh, take this presentation away and, and use it within your own organizations. So these, uh, these graphs are created in relation to stress, depression, or anxiety in the UK and Great Britain. And they're published by the Health and Safety Executive. What you can see on the far left is the prevalence of self-reported work-related uh, stress, depression, or anxiety by age and gender was in the period 1819 to 2021. The next one, so center left, is the prevalence for work related by occupation. That's in the, the same period. And then right middle is the prevalence of self-reported by workplace size. And then we have the prevalence that was caused by or made worse by work. Now getting down with those figures and examining what we're really looking at there is, is fascinating work. Fascinating work for someone like me, and hopefully fascinating work for somebody like yourself. But what it does do is it highlights to us certain at-risk categories. So, for example, uh, we should, as I say, definitely be talking to professional females that are in large companies about their workload. What we can extrapolate from data like this, we can then use in the techniques and methodologies that I'm going to describe later on in this presentation in order to make sure that we have commensurate controls for the mental health risks that we identify within our organizations. However, as with so much, it's never quite as simple as it seems on the outside. So the current stats, and this is a this is a, a fascinating report recently published uh, by the London School of Economics and the Mental Health Foundation, and they said that mental health problems, as they put it, cost the UK economy at least 117.9 billion per year, and that's the uh, that's the figure that they can actually extrapolate from the treatments and, and assign to the issues, so to speak. I don't like using the word problem. However, these thoughts are almost certainly exceptionally conservative. They don't include things like absenteeism, poor performance when you're in work, staff turnover. And when we take in the, the almost invisible costs, so to speak, and we try and put a tangible value on them, then the leading thoughts are that we'd be talking probably somewhere in the region of 42 to 45 billion. Now, the reason that I put a, 
an iceberg there is because I think it's quite appropriate. Um, I think what we're seeing just now is very much the tip of the iceberg. I think that we don't realize, we don't understand, we don't see the full extent of the problem we're actually facing right now. As you can see by what I've written there, specialist mental health care costs are estimated to be about 13 billion. It's about 11% of the total costs. These costs actually reflect service use. They don't include unmet need. So in England in 2019, 44% of mental health service providers reported being unable to meet current demands for inpatient services. And that was rising, unfortunately, to 58% for community mental health services, and then 81% for child to adolescent mental health services. So what we can derive from this opening contextual silo that I've just fired at you is that we're unprepared. And if you are an advocate of the stages of learning as I am, I think to a degree right now, we're unconsciously incompetent. But I, I would like to think the people on this call you know, we we know the questions we should be asking, and we're we're seeking the answers. So we're 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 making our way through that through that journey to get ourselves into a more competent place. Now, what our senior managers and what our boards will be looking for, undoubtedly, is a return on investment for any kind of investment that we're going to make towards mental health. So it's the it's the whole What's it going to do for us? What's it going to give back? What I've done there is I've put a range of measures together with the return on investment on a sliding scale from left to right. Now, to be clear, I haven't done this. This is, again, taken through the LSE and Mental Health Foundation report. And what it does is it gives you an indication of the average ROI for the different techniques that can be used. And that's everything from having a mental health therapist come in and speak to your staff down to sitting very, very basic computer-based exercises at an appropriate frequency within your organization. As I say on the right-hand side, with every industry, every organization, and every member of our workforce being wonderfully unique, the data and or logic does not suggest that a one-size-fits-all approach would work. What we need is a targeted, multifaceted approach that brings a range of preventative and mitigating measures to the workplace so that we can hedge risk and yield reward. And before I stop and ask for any questions, we're about just over 20 minutes in, um, I would like to reflect on a conversation that I had with somebody, with a professional, um, on this very topic um, a, a number of months back now. And uh, the chap in question is called Brett Townsley, and he is uh, he's a leading professional in this area. And I was speaking to Brett about the merits of mental health first aiders, and I was I said to Brett proudly. That I would, uh, I would love to invest in an initiative of mental health first aiders. And Brett looked at me and smiled, um, and said, "That is, that's brilliant. That's excellent. But you realise that's a reactive measure. So let's now have an intelligent conversation where we wind everything back a little bit. Why don't we start controlling the enablers that make us have to have mental health first aid training?" And that's really when it clicked. So what we're going to do within part two of this presentation is we're going to get down and talk about the real proactive enablers. But at this point, I would like to stop and give everyone the opportunity to ask questions. Hello there, Steve. Thank you for that. Um, just a couple of comments from people. Somebody said, could you um start your slideshow from the current slide so they can see the whole screen some of the text is a little small perfect yeah, no yeah if you could do that perfect thank you and um 
Another comment from somebody was that uh, they really liked that great safety moment at the start of your presentation and the understanding that people are people and no two are the same. So they really appreciated that. Um, so we do have some uh, some questions. So the, the first question is, uh, what are the biggest barriers at senior management or board level? Uh, the biggest barriers, uh, it's, it's a great question. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for the person that commented on the safety moment, because uh, I actually had another safety moment ready to go about five minutes ago. And at the very last minute, I thought, no, you know what? Let's lay it all out there. So I appreciate that comment. Um, at, at senior management and board level, uh, I tend to find that there are two main blockers. The first blocker is that um, sometimes the return on investment isn't understood and isn't believed. Um, and the other blocker is that uh, sometimes we have, and I don't mean to be disrespectful here, but I met an awful lot of status quo stalwarts people that are anchored in a Dunkirk spirit, you know, mental health, just get on with it. It doesn't really exist. Um, so there is a behavioral change that I tend to address with nudges and evidence, um, but sometimes you, you, you simply can't change someone's opinion. Um, but on the ROI side, there is more and more valid evidence coming across about uh, the benefits for a business, and they simply can't be can't be ignored anymore. So, like the so much that we do in our day to day lives, the risk management professional will never be judged on the goals that he saves or she saves. They'll always be judged on the ones that they let in, and we simply can't afford to let any of these goals in. So, skill is taking the evidence knowing your senior management and board members well enough to be able to present that evidence in a way that they understand that resonates with them. I tend to find the best way to do that is to manage my stakeholders before the meeting, get myself a couple of allies that are already bought into the idea so that it's not just me presenting my initiative, it's me presenting an initiative that at least a quarter of the room is already bought into. But great question, thank you for that. I hope I, I hope I did it justice with an answer. Thank you. And you mentioned a moment ago about mental health first aiders. So how do they fit into all of this and where do they fit in? Well, that's a great question. That's, <laughs> that's a good question. So uh, let, me, let me give the example of COVID, uh, which again, I know we're all very familiar with. Um, when we're putting our our barriers in place, if we like to think of uh, the Swiss cheese model, so to speak, we would never rely on face masks alone. We'd never rely on social distancing alone. We'd never rely on increased cleaning regimes alone. What we do is we'd include them in a range of measures, which means that the preventative and mitigating measures are commensurate to the hazard. Where mental health first aiders fit in is after the event. They're a reactive measure. So they're able to tell us whether we're actually doing well in our proactive measures. They come in afterwards. And what they do as well is that I, I speak to a lot of clients about who should be my mental health first aiders. And it has to be people that are interested, it has to be people that are passionate, and people that get it, people that get that there is no real difference between physical and mental health. We have days where we are physically fit and strong. We have days where we bump our arm and we're not so strong. We can't lift such heavy things in the same way as with our mental health. We have days where we are fit and strong and days where we're not so much. So they really need to be able to get that. But they also need to be champions within the business. So within a business, you tend to find that there is a formal hierarchy where you have your, your CEO and your senior leadership team and your exec leadership team, and it comes down and it comes down. But then you have the informal hierarchy who are made up of these really, really interesting influencers who have this sometimes natural born ability to lead. They talk and people listen. I tend to try and target them for my mental health first aiders because 
then not only have I got a reactive measure, but I've got a cultural influencer who says mental health challenges are a thing. They're a thing that we should all be thinking about and a thing that I'm happy to talk about. And hence, they, they, they nudge the stigma uh, away from the stigma into just where it should be, which is just a topic for conversation. It's a long way around to answer that question. It's a, it's a great question. Thank you. So I've got some more questions coming in. Um, is the HSA doing enough? Um, would being riddle reportable make employers address some of the work-related stresses? Uh, work-related stress can come from a single definable event, which is one of the excuses the question poser has heard for the reason why it currently isn't. Yeah, is, is the HSE doing enough? So, um, I don't know whether any of us are really doing enough. Would making it a RID or reportable event highlight it to employers? It would certainly make that senior management and leadership conversation an awful lot easier. But do punitive measures on their own? Is that where we want to be in order to drive compliance to manage things like work-related stress and mental health challenges? That has to be a, an autonomous, organic, cultural growth. So what would happen if the HSC said that it was written or reportable? Well, I'm hearing that, you know, there is an argument to say that. I, I, I don't think that would be the way forward. Uh, I, I think it would, again, be one measure in a raft of measures for us to take it forward. But yeah, I'd answer that question in a very political way, and I do apologise, but for the HSE doing enough, I'm going to answer it with a question. Is anyone doing enough? Um, with the data that I gave at the start of this presentation, I, I think we've all got a, we've all got a journey to make. Thank you. Um, do you think working from home is hiding mental health, and how do we support colleagues and recognise when help may be needed? This is the question. This is an incredible question. Um, so we don't have the face-to-face -face time with our personnel. So the inherent indicators that we've all been trained and taught to look for, the likes of the behavioural change, it is more difficult to, to get. Now, I read one article that said that 75% communication was lost when it's done on a computer screen. That's that links back to my previous point. That it is a lot. It, it, it's more difficult to pick up. However, working from home, there are pros and there's cons to this. Now, I think working from home is fine. I don't believe that the issue is with the employee. I think the issue is with the employer. It's not that we can't work from home. It's that our managers struggle to manage remotely. That is a skill that rests on fundamental principles that are not yet truly accepted by the industry or by any industry that I've seen. So yeah, I, to answer the question, does it does it make it more difficult? Yes, it does. Um, are we still feeling our way and getting used to working from home? Yes. Um, are we still getting used to the communication streams and managing remotely? Yes. To me, where does the burden lie? Uh, the burden doesn't lie with the employee. The burden lies with the employer to learn how to manage remotely, not to necessarily bring everybody back into an office because they can't manage remotely. So a very, a very topical and debatable answer I've given. I know not everyone will agree, but I would welcome a virtual coffee after this to discuss further. Thank you. Another question's come in. Um, is there a link between management teams taking mental health seriously, putting measures in place to mitigate and manage them, and the diversity or inclusion within the management team? Oh, now that is, uh, gosh, that's a postgraduate research project right there. That's fantastic. Um, what I can say about diverse teams is that, um, well, first of all, I mean, we know there's no binary answer to this question, but we can certainly lean towards one side. Now, 
if you had a more diverse management team, then you have more diverse thinking, you have more diverse solutions, and hence you have smarter outcomes. That in itself, there, there's lots and lots of evidence behind that produced by everyone from McKinsey to the government. Um, that would lead us to the logical conclusion that a more diverse management team would be better at solving any solution, be it uh, coming from mental health challenges or coming from other more uh, traditional commercial challenges. So yeah, can I give you a binary yes or no on that? No. Could I provide you with a raft of evidence that says that diverse management teams are better at managing challenges? Yes, I could. Could I, could I give you the, the same raft of evidence about um, management teams who are all from the same mould, not in comparison to diverse management teams? So, yeah, I, I think you've got a really interesting thread to pull on there. Thank you. So this is somebody that has a senior manager who has work-related stress and one of the sources of that stress is actually one of the directors and they're just wondering what advice you could give them about how you would approach that director. That, that's, a, that's a really great question and you know everybody's different aren't they? So uh, I remember when I, when I first started working offshore on oil rigs there was uh, we did a personality test. I worked for a company called Transocean, and we did a personality test that was a colors test that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. And that was developed by Carl Jung, who was an incredibly intelligent chap, certainly gave Freud a run for his money. And what Carl Jung did was he, uh, for what to a better expression, pigeonholed people into traits. So I was a, I was a high red and my second colour was green, which means I was very proactive, but I was very evidence-based. So if somebody came to me with something, the way that they'd communicate to me would be very directly, but so I, I wouldn't need any of the social graces, but I would require evidence. So the best way to approach the director is to analyse, see what kind of person they are and think about their reaction, think about the way the conversation is going to go, and also think about the resources that you have at your disposal. Specifically, think about your human resource department and whether you should be bringing this up with them confidentially before you speak to the director, or whether you can, uh, whether you can have that informal coffee in the canteen. But uh, I can't give you a I can't give you an answer to that. It's very much dependent upon your relationship with the director. Okay, thank but you. Best of luck is what I should say. <laughs> um, so if you consider the six key areas of stress being demand, control, support, relationships, role and changes, where are the gaps and how do we ensure the strength of the link between all these? It's a fantastic question, and I'm very happy to say that I'm going to answer that question in the in the second part of my presentation. So uh, stay tuned, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, so coming in thick and fast with questions. Uh, so looking at the stressful nature of working in the mining industry, what proactive controls can management adapt to aid their employees, especially somebody like a truck operator? operating for 12 hours etc yeah and again that's that's exactly what we're going to get into in the second half of the the presentation i'm really glad that the previous person that asked the question brought up the six uh the six areas of stressors um because it's all about designing that employee experience to be as don't want to be as as sympathetic to the person as possible but I do remember a number of years ago, I was speaking to an HR professional, and they talked about the fit. And I said, well, what, what do you mean the fit? And I was looking to bring someone onto my team, and they said, well, it's not just the fit between you and the person, it's the fit between you and the person, the team and the person, the organization and the person, the CEO and the person, even the office and the person, the person's personal life and their career. There's a number of different fits there. So what we're going to talk about in the second half of the presentation is the process that we use to derive the best fit possible for our people and then how we can put indicators out there about 
whether we've done done well enough or not. And uh, and hopefully our truck operators in places like mining industries are are brought into the fold and considered a little bit more. Uh, the really interesting thing in the mining industry is is exactly the same as other more remote industries, such as uh, let's talk about the offshore industry again or the, the maritime industry, where there's uh, we're, we're not just fighting um, to evolve something. It's almost like we need to start a revolution because we're fighting against the culture of deniability. Um, almost corporate deniability at times, but uh, individual deniability, certainly. But yeah, great question. We'll get to that in the second half. I started to get very philosophical there. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Steve. I think what we'll do is we'll pause the questions there. I've still got a few more comments and questions that we can pick up towards the end of the presentation. So I hand back to you now for the presentation to continue. To continue. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, so before we uh, before we go on, um, just a, a little summary of what we're really looking at here in terms of the return on investment program, and just to reinforce as well what I said earlier, which is that we don't need to deploy all of these measures. We don't need to deploy any of these measures. What we need to do is we need to assess if we have a challenge and proactively address it. So yeah, let's move on. So core standards, uh, a framework for all organizations. Now there is a, a report called Thriving at Work that's the Stevenson and Farmer Review of Mental Health and Employers. And it is a, a, a genuinely, it's a fascinating report. Uh, the, the PM asked Stevenson and Farmer to go away and have a look at this issue. And it was Stevenson and Farmer, I believe, that came up with the six standards that were then adopted by the Health and Safety Executive and taken forward into the Management Standards Executive. But what they came up with as well was a framework for all organizations. Now, I'm uh, one of my one of my subjects that I am incredibly passionate about is leadership. And uh, within the UK, uh, I always think that the uh, epitome of leadership, the, the gold standard is written by the armed forces, is written by the army. Uh, regardless of what you think of the organization, they, they really know what they're talking about when it comes to leadership. And they have a center for army leadership. And they talk about a leadership doctrine. They talk about leadership values. And I think that's really important. And I always, I always think that it would be best, and that's what I advise my clients to do, is come down with a doctrine, come down with core standards, come down with a framework in terms of mental health. Because, uh, as I mentioned, Analysis shows that around 15% of people at work have symptoms of an existing mental health condition, and that is a conservative estimate as well. So the core standards are the, the first standard we to produce, implement, and communicate a mental health at work plan. And I, I don't need to wax lyrical to the people on this call about how important it is to engage the workforce in making that plan. Number two is develop mental health awareness among the employees. Again, kind of bridge back to what I discussed earlier about removing the stigma around mental health by making it a common conversation in the same way as you can undoubtedly tell in this call that I, I have a cold just now. People will ask me about my cold. I don't expect people to ask me about my mental health in the same way as they ask about my cold, but I do expect mental health as an umbrella term to be discussed within the workplace. Encourage open conversations about mental health and support available, uh, and make sure support is available when employees are struggling. So think about your employee assistance program, think about your mental health first aiders, but also think about coaching and mentoring of line managers and supervisors, which is down at number five there. Routinely monitor employee mental health and well-being, and you can integrate that within your safety climate surveys, which will hopefully then feed into your safety culture improvement plan. And number four, 
was to jump around, provide employees with good working conditions and ensure they have a healthy work-life balance and opportunities for development. I was discussing this with Sue just before we came on the line that uh, working from home in COVID has taken us into a very uh, different space than it was before, where sometimes it's difficult to tell where our responsibilities start and where they stop. I would advise caution when we're talking about ensuring that anyone has a healthy work-life balance. Your job is to ensure that they are healthy whilst they're at work and to potentially offer avenues of assistance to make their personal life easier as well. Hence the employee availability, the, the employee assistance program. So um, pardon my very poor punt, linking causes with solutions. Um, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. Uh, I think it's a wonderful platform in order to access people that you would never have the, the opportunity to talk to. And primarily, I, I use it to add real value. Um, people can choose to listen to what I say or not, uh, which again is, is a great barometer. But I use it quite extensively. And I, I, I mentioned that I'm hosting a webinar Wednesday the 16th of March. This is, you know, here we are. And I'll be talking about how to include mental health risk within a management system. I'd love to build a poll into my presentation uh, so you could tell me what you think the leading causes are. And what I did was I took the uh, the, the six areas um, and kind of changed the wording a little bit. Put them down. But there's definitely a feeling of poor, man poor leadership and support. And, uh, over on the right hand side there there was a, a, a number of uh, a number of comments that came back uh, through some brilliant people uh, got some wonderful connections Dan Wilkins and uh, some Diamond and some incredible people and they talked about workplace gossips a uh, particular funny one or not funny from uh, Chris Anderson who's a very well respected colleague um, saying that individuals demand Ferrari performance on a forward budget, office politics, and a combination of things, some relationships, role fulfillment. That was by James Brown, who's, again, a very well-respected colleague. So the reason that I put this, uh, this slide in there is because, uh, again, I want you to be able to take this PowerPoint away, and you can use this genuine objective empirical data to to stimulate thought, hopefully, in the way that you're going to tackle things back in your organization. So designing a better employee experience. Uh, the work design that you see on the left-hand side, we're going to go through the six, six standards. Uh, so the demands, the employees indicate that they can cope with the demands. And what I've said in the indicators column is, if I were you, this is really where I'd be dipping my toe in your safety and climate surveys to get the real feeling of what your workforce is experiencing. The solutions, the bullet points on the right hand side, are some things that you might want to do to, uh, in order to combat what we, the, the, the answers that you get in climate surveys. So, for example, provide adequate and achievable demands in relation to the agreed hours of work skills and abilities are actually matched to the job demands. Jobs are designed to be within the capabilities of employees and employees concerns about their work environment are addressed. Now I'm a very process oriented person and in terms of demands what I've seen work best is to have the job description revised by the employee. That job description is then approved by the line manager and the job description is used for the appraisal process which is usually on an annual basis with a six-month health check or check-in where you balance the job description against the job demands and make sure that they are actually one and the same. I can't tell you how many organizations that I've gone into in order to do performance analysis where I have found that there has been mission creep, so to speak, that you have a team of six people 
all of which have relatively similar job descriptions, all the job descriptions of which fill pieces of the puzzle completely. But one person does their job to 60%, another one does it to 80%, another one does it to 90%, leaving the remaining three to do their jobs to 110%, 120%, 140% in order to make the team work. And that comes back to the manager, not really, or the leader, not really being where they need to be. So demands, job description is a, is a, is a key thing for me. Control is when people, um, when they, they don't feel like they have control on how they actually achieve their work. And this is where your employee surveys, and this is where you can make HR you know, a real advocate and a champion of change. And there's no HR department in the world that doesn't think about their image to the workforce because their image is essential in hearing the information that they need to hear doing the job that they do. So making sure that the employees have control over their work patterns, not even control, but certainly influence is absolutely essential. Support, as you saw by my LinkedIn survey, again, is absolutely critical to make sure that you think that you have the ability, but also the support structure in order to achieve your job goals. Relationships. What are relationships like in the organization? Back in the days of uh, Gordon Gecko, and if you know who Gordon Gecko is, fantastic. If you don't know who Gordon Gecko is, then I'm glad that I've managed to attract a diverse audience to this, uh, to this webinar of performance organizations are, are very much in the past. Now, leading organizations tend to find more growth and culturally accepting, inclusive and diverse organizations. So tracking the relationships that a person is subjected to is essential. Making sure that they understand their roles and responsibilities. And again, that harks back to the uh, what we discussed with the demands of the, the job description. And also change within the organization and making sure that the person uh, the person has the ability to influence. Now I've gone through that quite fast and the reason I've gone through it quite fast is, is the same reason that I put quite a lot of words into the presentation and that's so that you can take it away and, and have a look yourself. Because the really interesting stuff comes down to the steps and what we really need to do and I'm very cognizant of the fact that we, uh, we only have eight or so minutes left. So. We need to start by thinking about securing the commitment of the senior managers. I know you've heard it time and again, but this really is owned. Well, it's driven top down, but it's got to be owned bottom up because the vast majority of your people are at the bottom of the organization or towards the lower end of the hierarchy. Hence the fact why most organizational charts will be in a triangle. So it's good practice to set up a project or a steering group to oversee this work and make sure you're inclusive as you possibly can be. So do we want senior and line managers in there? Yes, we do. But you'd be wary of which senior and line managers we want in there. We don't necessarily want the autocratic type of leader. It would be more a servant leader that we'd be looking for within this, this group. Make sure you've got your health and safety managers, your trade union health and safety reps, and employee reps, as well as HR. And if you can include an occupational health representative, then all the better. So what are we doing? We're identifying the stress risk factors. And the HSE have got a wonderful template for a risk assessment on their site, which is free to download. And it gives extensive examples of what you should be looking for in terms of demands, control, support, role, change, and relationships. So I would invite you to go to the HSE website and download that template of risk assessment and pen it out yourself as a draft and see where you think that you sit right now before you start including anyone else in that. And it'll make your conversations an awful lot more informed when you start to gather in your stakeholders. Decide who might be harmed and how. So 
within, I mean, obviously everybody can be harmed by mental health, but within everything that we do in risk, we prioritize. So sit down with HR, and there's a good chance that you'll have the sickness, absence data, staff turnover rates, what people have said in exit interviews, even the amount of referrals to occupational health providers that you have in your employee assistance programs. Obviously, you'd never be looking for names of people that contacted your employee assistance program because that, that would be a self-defeating exercise, but it would be interesting to know whether the person can tell you perhaps which office they were from or the occupation that they do or even the level of management that they're in. Once you know that, then you're coming down to evaluate your risks. And again, the HSE has a, a fantastic kind of tick sheet on that. Recording your findings, because as I said, it's really interesting when you're recording your findings because the risks are often different for different levels of the organization. They're going to be different for an individual, they're going to be different for a team, they're going to be different for a department, they're going to be different in the division, they're going to be different no matter where you are in the world. The risks that I have with my organization in Aberdeen will not be the same as the risks that I have with my organization in Houston, and they certainly won't be the same as the risks that my business partners in other organizations have with their operations in the Ukraine, which is a terrible, terrible thing that's happening. So you need to consider that. You need to match that with your short, medium, or long-term goals and make sure that they're achievable. Earlier on in the presentation, I said that perhaps you can think about creating a steering group, but also a project group where you can stage gate and Gantt chart your plans and your progress so you can continually feed back to the workforce, but also continually feed back to your management on the progress that's being made. Lastly, to monitor and review. You've got to monitor the actions in the plan to ensure they have the desired effect and the appropriate time scale. And that's all about setting yourself those realistic goals, deriving KPIs about where you want to be, then executing. Now, I'm a huge fan of safety climate surveys. There's an awful lot of the more uh, traditional or legacy thinkers that don't put any credence in that type of what they refer to soft skills and soft evidence. However, they work fantastically well when we're talking about mental health challenges. And some stats to finish with. So only 11% of the top 100 companies in Great Britain have disclosed information about their initiatives to support their employees' mental health in their annual reports. I would think that that would be an exemplar of how much you care about your workforce and that you are a progressive organization. Eight in 10 employers report no cases of employees disclosing a mental health condition. No cases of employees disclosing a condition. That is a very worrying statistic. And overall, around four in 10 organizations have policies or systems in place to support employees with common mental health. And only 24% of managers have received some form of training on mental health at work. 11% of employees discuss the recent mental health problem with the line manager, and half of employees say they would not discuss mental health with their line managers. So there's a piece here as well about coaching and mentoring the line managers. And what I tend to do is advise my clients, and I do this within my own organization as well, where we give out regular briefing packs on a quarterly basis, keeping the managers appraised of trends within the industry and techniques that they can use when they're engaging with their personnel. But I do think about that question that was asked earlier on. We're still feeling our way in terms of managing remotely. I don't think anyone's really cracked it yet. So that's the end of my short presentation. Um, I know I only have a couple of minutes left, but Sue, I'd like to open it up for questions again. Yeah, we've still got some questions, Steve. We've got a few more minutes. That's absolutely fine. Um, just some comments, really, I think, first of all. Um, somebody has said that one of the biggest blockers in, in their experience is that senior managers and directors do not always believe that work-related mental health actually exists. 
Yeah, right. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's very much, uh, it's almost like the, the personal process safety debate. Uh, so again, if we bring it back to offshore, for example, if we take it back to Macondo and Deepwater Horizon, uh, BP were actually on that rig at the time giving a personal safety award because nobody had seen any risk in terms of people getting hurt. Little did they know that the integrity of the well below them was bubbling away and that there was going to be imminent tragedy with horrible loss of 11 lives and a huge oil spill. So I, I totally appreciate and empathize with what you're saying. Many senior managers, they only see personal safety. They don't see the bigger process problem, bigger risk. That goes back to what I said earlier. It's about communication. It's about deriving the data. It's about knowing your audience and managing your stakeholders. It's not easy. No. Um, somebody else has commented uh, that a mental first aider on its own is like putting a plaster on a hemorrhage. Uh, they need management staff and systems to support them, much like a physical first aider. Would you agree? I'd agree 100%. Absolutely. Um, I, I, if you were to ask me to draw a Draw differences between mental health and first aiders and physical physical first aiders. No, there's there's it's it's the same. It's us as a human. So yes, absolutely. Okay, and um, how does the organisational culture have an effect on mental health? Oh, that's a great question. So um, what we're really looking for is we're looking for a supportive growth culture. We're looking for an inclusive culture where shared values overcome any individual differences. So what you'll see, and I'm, 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 I do a lot of case studies with military examples as well. So let's talk about Ukraine just now. Um, and again, I think it's awful the humanitarian crisis that's happening, regardless of where you sit on the conflict, the humanitarian crisis is terrible. But what we have seen is a, a, an entire country of diverse people rally together in solidarity against the common enemy and, and you can really use that as an example for your own culture about those shared values that overcome any individual difference within the organization so we're all going towards one place and in order for me to get to that place i have to make sure everybody else gets to that place and then we become self-supportive and then the difference in performance starts to get excess it, 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 it just starts to take off it's incredibly interesting so culture yeah cul culture is the way we do things thank you um so should stress or mental health be an organizational priority as hse has stress as a priority yes very much so very much so um i would i would start as I said in the presentation, every organization, every industry, everyone is different. I would start by addressing the, uh, go to the HSC's website. They have a very, very interesting stress tool on the website as well, which talks about the six um, areas again. And, and, and really spend some time and get, get familiar with the website, get familiar with what they have on there. The HSE and the UK legal framework is really interesting. It's goal setting. And it's goal setting because they know that one size really doesn't fit all. But they do give us the instruments or certainly the hint or the taste of the instruments that we need to develop ourselves within our own organization. So that's why it's not too prescriptive. But I, I, I've got some very good friends that work for the HSE and I think they've come up with some, I would tell you if I didn't like it, but I do think they, they've come up with some pretty good stuff. Now, this is an interesting question about your own organisation. Um, do you have mental health and well-being within your own company values and or your mission statement? We have, uh, so our values are passion, trust and partnership. So we are passionate about what we do. We have trust within um, our clients, but trust within our organisation, with each other. But the partnership one is where it comes into its own. So I partner externally, I partner with regulators, I partner with clients, I partner with this, I partner with that. But uh, my external partnerships are, 
I say this openly to my clients, are very much secondary to my internal partnerships. Uh, within the organization, we grow a strength so that by the time we speak externally, we are one cohesive organization that self-supports. Are we perfect? No, no, no organization will ever be. But um, we openly talk about mental health. It's not a stigma. It's uh, we have an employee assistance program. We have a very active and proactive uh, human resources department. I actually have two of my Aberdeen office on mental health first aid or training today. Now, um, the stats at the beginning of the presentation simply justify it. If I had stats like that about cut fingers, we'd be doing an awful lot in cut fingers. But, it, you know, it, it's data driven. Thank you. And you've mentioned training several times throughout the, pres uh, the presentation. Do we need to have people going on mental health training courses? And do is that at managerial level or employee level? Who should be going on this training? It's a great question. Um, so it depends where you're going to prioritize mental health within your organization. Um, and it depends whether you want to go external or keep it internal and whether you have the internal competence to do a train the trainer program. Um, do you need training? Um, for example, if you take the provision of use of work equipment regulations within the UK, do does everyone I send offshore have pure training? No, they don't, they're not certified as you are trained, not, well, not everyone, a lot are. Um, and do we need training? Well, it's debatable. Do you need training for mental health? If you do an extensive amount of reading and you come from an occupational health background, then okay, you're okay. If this is a new subject to you, then training in mental health will give you a return on investment. You can sit down with me and I will wax lyrical to you and tell you how to make every single organizational performance improvement you can possibly imagine. If you sit down with the chap I mentioned earlier on, Brett Townsley from Omniscient Safety, he will take you to a different level of knowledge than I have about mental health challenges themselves. So do you need training? Arguably, Section 2.2 of the 74 Act, Paragraph C, you're, you should have information instruction, supervision and training. So you should have training in some degree of this. If you want the best of the best, you go externally to someone like Brett. But can you manage it internally? Yes. The important thing is to have the conversation and start talking about mental health. Thank you. And in your experience, are there any sort of specific pinch points um, where mental health crises might actually occur? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I was always um, of the opinion that change, uh, so throughout my career, be it in the, in the security industry or the oil industry or nuclear or renewables or wherever I've worked, I've always found that people like uh, and gravitate towards predictability and reliability. And that's what I always teach leaders that, you know, you don't have to be the nicest person in the world. You don't have to be the nastiest person in the world. You just have to be the consistent person that you actually are. And there's many dimensions to that. And there's a dimension that also encapsulates the context of the world. And, and what I mean by that is that we have so much change happening with the climate crisis, with the pandemic, with geopolitics. And then you bring in the organizational change because of that other change which is resulting in things like the Great Resignation. It's resulting in things like potentially spiraling inflation that is not being matched by, by wages. The pinch points for me come from change and poorly managed change. If you can identify and manage change, you're, you're better than nine out of 10 out there. Thank you. And, Final question, I think, is will this actually, all this work in sort of looking at mental health, will that actually pull focus away from any other risk initiatives? Oh, it's a, it's a great question, and I don't think so. Um, I think it's, uh, I, like I said with the iceberg, uh, very poor iceberg metaphor, that I, I, I think it's, it's not quite where it needs to be, and I think it needs to be elevated. I think anything when you're talking about intelligent risk management cross-pollinates into other areas. 
Um, and the same with mental health. We can, again, teach people how to intelligently manage risk and how to step out of a box that has been organizationally wise pretty much the same since the industrial revolution we've done the same thing for the last 250 years so we can teach people how to step out of that box how to manage risk in the current world and how to do that intelligently and take care of their people so will mental health take away some other initiatives maybe it will but will it add a huge amount of value as well i think your p and l sheet would be more p than l on this one that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions. So I think we'll leave it there uh, today. Thank you very much, Steve, for such an interesting and informative session. And thank you to everybody that's joined us this afternoon for some great questions as well. Um, I'll put the recording up onto the YouTube channel either later today or tomorrow. So you will be able to catch up in your own time and recap on anything. Um, I will also email everybody that's attended today a copy of Steve's uh, presentation as well. So as Steve has mentioned, that you, so you can then take that back into your own organization and use as you see fit. Um, thank you ever so much again, Steve, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you all for attending. Um, have a great rest of your day, and now we'll end the PowerPoint. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everyone.